Hi class, in this video we're going to go over the topic on money. Um, so this is a very, even though it's a very long chapter, but it's mostly definitions, um, so pretty easy concepts, okay? So first you need to know what is a money. Uh, so money is any item that can be uh, accepted by both buyer and sellers in turn of trade. So when you go buy something, you pay for it with money, that's money. Um, but one thing to remember is that um, money uh, is not wealth that uh, just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you're rich, okay? Um, what really makes you rich is how much stuff you can buy with the money you have. That That's what making you rich. And also remember this, uh, money is not just currency. Uh, we have other monies that's besides currency, okay? So money is more than the currency you have. But currency are money. All right, so for um, there are three characteristics for money. Uh, they are called unit of account, medium change, and also store value. So unit of account um, is the um, is when you can use your money to measure the good of something else. So for example, I can tell you that this, uh, let's say, a computer is worth uh, maybe one thousand bottle water, and that bottle water that bottle water can be used as a unit of account. So you can use bottle water to measure the value of computer. Now, uh, what cannot be used as unit account? So if anything has a very large volume, uh, so let's say that um, you want to see uh, what is the price of a computer compared to maybe the painting by uh, Banksy. Now, the Banksy painting is very expensive. The last one was sold for about $4 million, right? So it's hard to value that because those values do tend to change and it's also very large. So it's hard to uh, to measure the bank, uh, the the um the wire for computer in turn of the painting by Banksy. Now I can do other way around. You can measure the value of Banksy painting in turn of computers. But if you switch it, try to measure the value of computers in turn of the painting, uh, it's not very useful because the value is so valuable. I mean the, the painting is so valuable. Okay. And then second, um, money must be a very good medium of the change. That means you can change money for something else and other people accept that. Uh, if you have something that nobody else wants to have, then then that's not a good store. Uh, that's good. That's not very good medium change. Uh, one example you can think of that's not a good medium change. Uh, think about maybe a, um, a Justin Bieber concert ticket. Right. Uh, so, so if somebody tried to give it to me, um, I would turn it down because I just don't want it. Right. So that would that would not be a good meaning of exchange. And last one is a store value. So, uh, so that means if you hold on to it, we retain the same value compared to before. Um, so, for example, that uh, any type of food is not a good store value. Imagine you hold on to a piece of um, you know bread. You know, after a couple of days, it'll go bad, right? So it's not a good store value. Um, but you know, if you hold on to cheese or hold on to a uh, bottle of wine, those might be good store values. Okay. All right. So um, for anything to become money, must be must satisfy these three criteria. So must be a very good unit of account, must be a very good meaning change, and must be a very good store value. Now let's look at the supply for money. So how much money we have available in the economy. So supply for money, they're uh, categorized as the M1 and also M2. So M1, they're the um, money that's very liquidable. Now liquidable means uh, you can turn to cash very quickly. That's called liquidable. Um, so oh my god, so many emails. <laughs> so um, so the so the most liquidable uh, asset that they are in M1, they're your cash. Um, your cash, your checking account, and then um, any type of traveler checks, those are M1. So we can turn to cash very quickly. Now M2 is everything in M1 plus your saving account. Those will be the M2. Because for M2, um, the part of saving, uh, you cannot turn this into cash quickly. That for most people, saving account, they have restrictions on how much cash they can withdraw. So that's in the category of M2, but not in M1. But your checking account is in M1, because there's usually no restrictions on how much money you can withdraw and how often you can withdraw. Okay, so M1 is very liquidable. Uh, M2 is not very liquidable, uh, but M1 is in M2. Now, uh, liquidity is defined as the degree of uh, asset can be turned to cash very quickly. Uh, so, for example, your house has very low liquidity. 
Because it takes it takes some time to sell the house and get the cash for it. Um, but the stuff that has very high liquidity, um, the most liquidable asset that can return to cash the most quickly is cash, right? Because cash is asset, right? So um, that's that's liquidity. All right, so M1, they're your demand deposit. That's your checking account. Um, traveler check, uh, other check for deposit, and the actual currencies, they're in M1. So these are very liquidable. Uh, M2 is everything in M1, including, uh, on top of that, your saving deposit, your small denomination time deposit, and then retail money, money fund. Um, now, this small uh, denomination time deposit, uh, that is something called a CD. Now, um, this is a question to test how old a person is. If you know what CD stands for, then you're pretty old, okay? Um, so if you ask your grandparents, your parents, what is CD, some of them might tell you that CD stands for is uh, Certificate Deposit. Now, that means they're pretty old, okay? So CD was popular in the old days. Um, they gave depositors a little higher interest rate, um, but the depositor cannot get the money out early. So usually you buy a time CD, so it's three months, six months, one year, and then you promise to keep the money in the account. Now, if you want to get your money out early, you lose the interest on it, and that's called a CD. Okay, all right. Um, oh, this uh, money market mutual fund, um, this is very popular now. So if you go to the most most banks today, um, they will have their advertised money market mutual fund the interest rate on it. Uh, money market mutual fund, um, the advantage for this is that the interest rate, the interest rate is floating. So it's either increasing or decreasing. It depends on the market interest rate. Okay, that's called a money market mutual fund. All right, so let's look at our Federal Reserve. So every country have a central bank. Uh, the central bank in America is called the Federal Reserve Banks. Now the Federal Reserve Bank in America, we have 12, uh, it's made up by 12 member banks. Uh, they're located over here, so Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Richmond, Atlanta, and so forth. Um, guys, this, this is what you can do. Um, look at the dollar bill you have. And on the dollar bill, at the front, uh, next to Georgie, <laughs> George Washington, um, there is a, um, a seal with a letter in the middle. So it can be a B, can be a K, can be a F. So there are, rather, there are letters in the middle. But the reason why different letters, um, each letter stands for a regional Federal Reserve Banks. So we have 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, um, and then each one does its own functions. Um, okay, so the most important Federal Reserve Bank is the one in uh, New York. Because the New York Federal Reserve Bank also oversees the entire Wall Street. Uh, and then also the New York Federal Reserve Bank, that's where our monetary policy is conducted, uh, where the open market operations conducted. Okay, so the New York is the most important Federal Reserve Banks. Now, um, our Federal Reserve Bank uh, is governed by the Board of Governors, um, and they're residing in D.C., and these guys, uh, they will meet on a regular basis to discuss the direction of the economy. So the Central Bank of U.S. is called the Federal Reserve Banks. So for our Board of Governors, uh, they're made up by seven Board of Governors. Each governor serves a 14-year term, um, and each one is appointed by the President and then confirmed by Senate. Now, if you guys think about this, you know, how long do, do these people serve? Uh, your President serves a four-year term, um, your Senator serves a six-year term, and a Representative in the House serves a two-year term. But a Board of Governors, each person serves a 14-year term. And the reason why it's more than everybody else is because we want the Board of Governors to be independent of the current political environment. So when these seven people are acting uh, in the Federal Reserve, they're acting in the best interest of our economy, not the best interest of any ruling parties. So these guys are truly independent. Well, not truly, but mostly independent. Okay, And also for the seven Board of Governors, um, we elect one of them. Not like we elect. Uh, the president will appoint one of them every four years to be the chairperson for Federal Reserve. And those chairpersons serve a four year term. So every four years, we get a new chairperson. So each president will have a chance to appoint their own chairperson. The current chairperson, his name is Jerome Powell. He was appointed by the, you know, obviously your, your President Trump, okay, the current president. All right, so uh, the function for Federal Reserve, so what do they do? They mostly do, mostly do three things. So Federal Reserve will do monetary policy. 
uh, banking supervision, and also financial services. So let's look at each one, okay? So for monetary policy, um, by definition, it's the action of a country's central bank to influence the supply for money and the credit in the economy. Now, the reason why that this is so important, because every economy needs money. If you don't have money, economy stop running. But if you have too much money, you have inflation in the economy. So that's why we want to keep a balance over here. So it's the job of our central bank to make sure that we have enough, but not too much money in the economy. And that's called a monetary policy. So for monetary policy, there's three tools for monetary policy. They're called open market operation, uh, discount rate, and then reserve requirement. We're going to go over more detail over this uh, in the next chapters. Uh, but for now, you need to know the definitions. So open market operation is the buying and selling of government security in the open market to change the money supply. Now, again, this is done in the New York Federal Reserve Banks, okay? So at New York Federal Reserve Bank, there's a trading desk. Um, the companies and investors can go there to buy and sell government bond directly from our Federal Reserve. So um, whenever the Federal Reserve buying and selling bond, they're buying and selling bond either from or away from the public. So that could change our money supply in the economy because many of your local banks, they're the holder of your government bond. So when the um, Federal Reserve buy bond, that's giving cash to the banks. When they sell bond, that's taking cash away from the banks. Okay, that's called the open market operations. Now next is called discount rate. So discount rate um, is the, the interest rate on the Federal Reserve will charge banks when banks borrow money from Federal Reserve. Now, your Federal Reserve not only is the central bank of U.S., it's also the bank to all banks. Uh, you and me or any individual companies, we cannot set up an account with Federal Reserve, but um, your local banks, any banks in America, they must have an account with Federal Reserve. So for this account, um, they can borrow, they can deposit money with Federal Reserve, but whenever they borrow money from Federal Reserve, they'll be charged an interest rate. And this interest rate is called a discount rate. Okay. Um, and then next is called a reserve requirement. So for any um, for any banks, uh, when they're taking deposit from depositors, a portion of deposit must be kept in the bank at all time. And this portion is called a reserve requirement. So let's suppose we have a bank. Um, let me use my one note. Uh, give me a little more space. All right, so let's suppose we have a bank taking deposit of $100, and then bank decide to loan out $90, and then the $10 is kept in the bank, right? That, that $10 is called a reserve. Can't spell. <laughs> it's called a reserve in the bank. So anytime you hear this this key uh, this thing called reserve, that just means cash. Okay, so how much cash are they keeping in the bank? So for our Federal Reserve, we force each bank to keep some cash in the bank. They can, the banks cannot loan everything else. That some money must be kept in the bank. And that's called the required reserve or reserve requirement. And then next, banking supervision. So our uh, Federal Reserve also conduct regular audit on the banks uh, to make sure the banks are run very safely. Uh, there's an office in the uh, in Federal Reserve it's called the OCC, it's the Office of Currency Controller. It's their job to conduct all day on the banks and also make sure they're not doing anything risky. Okay. All right. Um. Next, last one is our financial services. So banks also do the duty of clearing checks, uh, transfer funds, and also you know receiving delivering currencies. So more than often, if you see those uh, uh, armored trucks outside the banks uh, deliver cash, uh, they're operating by the Federal Reserve. Okay, um, manage wire transfers and also performing automa uh, automated clearing uh, clearing house services. All right, so for banks, so for our banking system, uh, it's called a fractional reserve banking system. So a fraction of the reserve must be kept in the bank at all time, um, because if your banking, if your banks loan everything out, they might have a bigger profit for the banks, um, but they will put, put the banks at a very risky position. Because if anybody try to get the money out, the money is not there, right? So the moment the bank is out of cash, 
the bank is called insolvent. Once the bank is insolvent, they are one step away from bankruptcy. So to ensure this banking stability, uh, we have this fractional reserve banking system that every bank must be kept uh, some cash on hand. And this requirement is called reserve requirement. So uh, this can be you know 5%, 10% of the deposit. So however much deposit you have, um, let's say 10% of it must be kept in the bank at all time. That's called reserve requirement or require reserve ratio. Now to find your reserve requirement, I'm going to take your deposit times your required reserve ratio, and that will get you a required reserve. So let's suppose your deposit is $100, and then the ratio is 10%, then $10 must be kept in the bank as required reserve. All right, so let's suppose we have a question here. So let's suppose our deposit is $20,000, and then the uh, required reserve ratio is 20%. Then how much is our required reserve? So to find required reserve, I'm going to take the required reserve ratio times the deposit. So 20% times $20,000, that will give you $4,000. Okay, so that's your required reserve ratio. I mean, that's your required reserve. And I also know what's an excess reserve. So excess reserve uh, is any time you have extra cash on hand that's more than your required reserve, that's called excess reserve. So to find excess reserve, uh, just use your total reserve, so the total cash you have, subtract the required cash you have, uh, that's your excess reserve. So for our previous example, let's suppose currently the bank is holding on to $5,000. Um, but they require to hold on to $4,000, that's our required reserve, then the excess will be just $1,000, and that's called the excess reserve. And for this excess reserve, um, the banks can loan this money out. Okay, so getting more profit out of it. All right, and then next, know a money multiplier. So money multiplier is that sometimes a one additional dollar in the economy can turn into a multiple amount of additional dollars in the economy. Um, wait, let me say it one more time. So one additional uh, dollar in the banking system can turn into more uh, more than one dollar additional cash in the entire economy. Um, so this is how it works. Let's suppose we have um, we have let's say person A. Give me this color, give me this. So person A borrowed uh, $1 from the bank. Now, how much money do we have in the economy right now? $1, right? That's how much money this person borrowed. Now, next day, the person A would um, will buy something with it from person B. So person A buys something from person B. So person B received $1, and I will also deposit the money back to the bank. So deposit the $1 back to the bank. Now, how much money do we have now? Person A no longer have the money now because he spent the money. Now, person B have the money, but the money is deposited in the bank. So once deposited, let's say person C will go to the bank, borrow $1. Now, how much money do we have in the economy now? Now, person B still have $1 because he deposited the money. But person C also have $1 because he borrowed it $1, right? So right now we have $2. So notice what's happening now, that our money supply is increasing. So every time when the banks lend money out, or people borrow money from the bank, our money supply will increase whenever there's lending going on. And how much money we can increase to, that's called a money multiplier. And it's a very simple formula. Uh, so money multiplier equals to change in the money supply divided by change in reserve. Um, this just equals to um, another simple formula that you, you, you will use in your class. It's your one divided by the required reserve ratio. So for our, for our previous example, our required reserve ratio was 20%. Then your money multiplier will be the one divided by 20%. That will give you $5 or five. Okay, um, so that means for every $1 additional money you lend out, um, you create an economy, you can potentially create five more dollars in the economy. All right, so let's continue. All 
All right, so let's try this question over here. Um, suppose the banking system has $2 million in checkable deposit. Um, the actual reserves are how much cash they have now. The actual reserve uh, is $600,000. By the way, anytime you guys hear this term called re uh, reserve, it just means cash. Okay, so this is just cash. Oh, no, I can't even write them. It's slow. That is just cash. All right, so. Um, they have currently six hundred thousand dollars of cash in the bank. Um, the reserve requirement is twenty percent, and the banks, uh, the banking system can can potentially increase money supply by how much? We're looking for two things. Uh, actually, three steps. So first step, we need to find out how much is our required reserve, and then second step, find out how much is your excess reserve. Next step, find out how much the money multiplier. At the very end, we can find out how much we can increase our money supply by. Okay, so let's see, let's see how this number works. Um, show me my one note. So our required reserve in this question is, um, so that's equal to total deposit times required reserve ratio. Now total deposit was how much? Uh, it was, $2 million and the required reserve ratio 20%. So $2 million um, times 20% of that. So the required reserve will be uh, $400,000. Now for excess reserve, this is your total reserve, which is $600,000. That's how much cash we have now. Minus your required reserve, so $400,000. Then we have a two hundred thousand dollars of excess reserve. Your money multiplier. Um, this is one divided by required reserve ratio. So one over twenty percent. That will give you a five. And then your change in money supply equals to the excess reserve times the money multiplier. So two hundred thousand dollars times five. That's a one million dollar change in money supply, okay? So the answer is gonna be D. All right, so next, uh, know the demand for money. Uh, so for demand for money, uh, demand for money coming from two demand. Uh, the transaction demand, also asset demand. So transaction demand is the uh, money used to buy goods and services. So and money used to for every everyday transactions. And the asset demand, this is the demand for money for investment purposes. Now, for transaction demand, how much money you need um, is independent of the interest rate. So how much money you need to buy goods and services every day? Oh, you don't look at the interest rate that much because you just need the money to buy groceries, right? So how much money you need is independent of the interest rate. But for your asset demand, that depends on the interest rate. So if the interest rate is high, then we're going to need less money. Um, but the interest rate is low, you might need more money. So demand for money is downward sloping. And then if you um, put it all together, your demand for money with both the asset demand and then, and the transaction demand looks like this. So there's a, it's a blue line going downward sloping. That's the demand for money. Now for supply for money, um, you gotta think about who supply the money, right? So it's the government, the Federal Reserve. Now when Federal Reserve supply the money, they don't care about how much interest rate is. Um, they supply the money based on how much money do we need. So supply for money is also independent of interest rate. So if you put two together, uh, you put the demand for money together and also supply for money together, you're gonna have the interest rate in the economy. Okay, so interest rate is determined by the intersection of the demand for money and also the supply for money by Federal Reserve. All right, so for our asset demand, um, there are two assets you need to know. Uh, they're called uh, money. <laughs> um, so if you just hold on to money, it has no interest on it, uh, but it's very safe. Uh, the other asset is called bond. That means you, you let somebody else borrow the money. So with bond, uh, has some interest on it, but it's risky. Okay, so it's about you know how much risk can you handle, uh, how much uh, interest you want to earn on the, on the investment you have. Um, 
And then for money market, um, money market will change whenever the, there is a shift in your money. Uh, whenever, whenever there's a shift in the money supply. So, so let's suppose your money supply is shifting to the from MS one to MS two. Then by this shift, you are lowering your interest rate. So when the interest rate is lowered, uh, that will increase uh, your demand for bond. So um, bond demand will go up, and then that will increase uh, your price of a bond. Okay. So I'm gonna go over more uh, details about the bond and also the money market in the later chapters. But for now, just know that um, the the demand for um, bond is based on the interest rate in the economy. Because for bond, you have a fixed interest rate. A fixed interest rate. Okay. Um, but for money, uh, this interest rate is floating. So whenever the interest rate for the market goes down, so imagine this is your uh, your saving account in the bank. Okay. So if your interest rate goes down in the bank, then you might want to look for other alternatives. And because interest rate is lower on the on the saving in the bank, and then the bond market offer you a fixed higher interest rate, then you want to buy more bond. But when you buy more bond, the price for bond will increase. Okay. All right. Um, lastly, is something called a Fisher equation. So for Fisher equation, we're going to compare our nominal interest rate and then your real interest rate. So nominal interest rate, um, this is like the face value of the interest rate the bank pays you. So imagine go to a bank, deposit your money, and then bank says we're going to we're going to give you a five percent interest on your deposit. That's called a nominal interest rate. Now the question is, how good is the five percent interest rate? Is it really five percent paying you? Because you also need to consider that while you put the money in the bank, there might be inflation going on. So imagine that your money goes up by five percent per year, but the price of everything else goes up by ten percent per year. So if you save your money in the bank, are you better off or worse off? Then you're worse off, right? So the other thing to look at it is how much is your real interest rate. This is how much is the profit for your investment. Okay. So this is the Fisher equation. Uh, Fisher equation is your nominal interest rate. That's your nominal interest rate equals to the real interest rate plus inflation. So the pi e that's your inflation. So it's your nominal rate. Because the real rate plus inflation, and that's your nominal, that's your Fisher equation. Okay. All right, guys. So that's it for this chapter. Um, have any question? Let me know. All right. Bye bye.